So welcome to Bromley Course in Miracles study group, January 2022, new year, new start. And so what I thought I'd do today is to go through some of the terminology and how I've come to understand it to, um, as I've gone through the course. Because the course teaches you in many different levels. So when I first started the course, it was teaching me all the psychology, the real basic psychology of stuff and law of attraction and as I've gone through it's become more and more spiritual and now the words mean something different and because you're all with me here in this study group you're all there so um, I'm going to share this with you and obviously it explains the course as we go along I, mean, I know we've got some new people so if there are questions just stop me and ask okay so the first thing to understand is that it is a study course Let me get my book course in miracles so it's not a book that you just read through and you're you know think it's all going to go in there it's a book that you study and that's why the language is very um, diff difficult when you begin but all you have to do is show up and read it and do the lessons and it will be done through you you'll be shown in your life you'll be taught um, and then you'll read the next bit and it will tell you exactly what happened there it's a, it's an amazing book to me it's a conversation with Jesus living breathing conversation because if he, he turned up in my front room I'd be more obsessed with him <gasps> oh my god Jesus was here how special am I and all of that whereas I share his mind I share his knowledge then I can be the light the truth the way the same as him all I've got to do is think like him be like him do what he did um, and then I can I can um, uh, go home to God as such um, now the word miracle is a course in miracles now this is the first one really where language is used very differently um, and if we if we look in the text um, if you've got your text with you hopefully they will be the same And just go to the very beginning where um, it actually gives you 50, I think it is, different definitions or principles of miracles. 50 principles of miracles. So it's not a word that you can understand in the way that we normally. So for me, you know, a miracle walking on water, producing, you know, 5,000 loaves out of an empty basket. Those things that are so far outside of normal life and normal reality that it would seem impossible for us to do. So you're not learning how to walk on water and how to produce these miracles. Miracles means God's loving thoughts. So if you see 12, uh, page 3 of chapter 1, number 12, miracles are thoughts. Thoughts can represent lower or bodily level experience or the higher or spiritual level of experience. One makes the physical and the other creates the spiritual. And note there the difference between make and create. Only God creates because he to create is to make something out of nothing in the way the course uses it. And make... You, when you make something, you A, you make it out of lack or need, but you use materials that are already in existence. So we can only make, we don't actually create as such on this level. So, 12 tells you it, uh, um, it's God's loving thoughts. Um, number three, miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. The real miracle is that love is the love that inspires them. So in this sense, everything that comes from love is a miracle because God is love, therefore all his thoughts are love. And 11, prayer is the medium of miracles. It's a means of communication, communion in action, communication means, because when there's an action, it's action with the C missing. So it's communion in action of the created with the creator. Through prayer, love is received. 
Through miracles, love is expressed. So there's, a, I mean, obviously you can read the other 50, but those three just really kind of what did sum you say up. About, uh, through prayer, what would love is expressed? Uh, yeah, I think that was it. Exactly. Let me read it exactly. Eleven. Number eleven. Oh yeah, love is, is received. Yeah. Got it? Okay. So. The most important word, obviously, next, is God. So, God isn't a person, isn't a man on the clouds. Forget all of the religious definitions of God. God means many things. Love, it's a mind, so it's a mind only. It's consciousness, not in the way that the Course uses that word, but it's consciousness, thoughts, ideas. And when you hold a thought in your head, that creative power creates that um, holds that thought in your mind and on this level then creates something outside. But because there is no outside, God is all that is, so one, let's say this, this is the only thing in existence, there's no borders though, so it's eternity and infinity, it exists all of the time in all of the space, so let's say this is the only thing that exists then this is one and this is whole. So anything else exists within it. There is nowhere else, there is nothing else. No other time apart from here and now, which is the eternal here and now. So the past and the future are tricks of the mind, if you like, which we'll come on to later. Okay, so if you like, you could say this represents God, and this is thought-based, okay? So it's only ideas that exist. So that's sometimes hard to get your head around, but God is mind. In the Course, it, when it talks about mind with a capital M, it's the mind of God. Yes? With me. Okay. Now, in that mind, there is only knowledge, okay? Knowledge is different to perception, and we'll, I'll come on to all of that later, okay? But just for now. So, knowledge is of God. Knowledge is sure, certain, truth, objective, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> and you really have to get that. So, when there's doubt then you're not thinking with God. If you're unsure, if there's fear, anxiety, all of these things, it tells you you're thinking with the ego, not with God. Does this make sense? Okay, so it's also eternal, changeless, and truth. So that is what God is. When it mentions God, it's that quality Yes? Okay. So if you hold a thought in your mind, this in some ways is how God created the Son of God. So the Son of God is an idea also, because that's the only thing that exists. Yeah? So if I say like, if I reverse it and, and say now I'm God, and I'm thinking about this as my Son, because there's only mind, I would just be holding this in my mind. But my creative energy of my mind is what creates it, what gives it life. Because if, if I'm feeding this, let's say this is a glass, this receives my light, if you like, my knowledge, whatever you want to call it, and that goes through it, doesn't it, to the whatever the next thing is, and that's, when God creates with the Son, they become your creations, your sons, your ideas. And ourselves are just an idea, aren't they, really? In your dream, you believe you're a real character, you believe you're a real person. 
but it's just an idea in your head, isn't it? You're asleep. You're not doing anything. That person doesn't exist anywhere, and neither do any of those dream characters. They only exist in your head. So they are held thoughts. So that's the closest analogy that we've got to how it really is, reality really is, if you like, in heaven. Any questions about that so far? Could I ask you, please, yeah. so if we're thoughts and we're going back to where we're all one, we all come from the source, we all come from the light. So in other words, then, we are all thoughts, but we all head back to the light because that's where we've come from. No, you never way? left the light. How, where are uh, you going? Right, yeah. yeah. There is no, this is the fundamental. There is nowhere else. Mm. It's an illusion. It's a fantasy that you're, you know, if I close my eyes and I imagine I'm on the beach in Brighton, I'm not actually there, am I? Mm. But I'm there in my mind. So if the only thing that exists is mind, I am there. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Um, so mind is the, act, mind with a capital M, God's mind, is the initiating and activating agent of spirit providing its creative power. So God's mind powers you, powers you as spirit. And then that becomes your creative power. That's why you can only create with the Father you can't create on your own, which is why none of this really exists. Now, I know this is a bit out there for the newbies, but, you know, you, you will see it as the course develops. Okay, so, the Christ is the Son of God in its whole state. Okay? So, you can have an individual perspective within the one, within the oneness, you can have an individual perspective, doesn't mean you're separate, but it's like, if we say this is one event, but you all have a different point of view from where you are, um, and think about what I'm saying and hear different things, don't you? So it's kind of like that. Um, so the Christ is where uh, the, all the sons of God are in communion, together, communicating together as one. So one mind, yeah, with God. The reason they use uh, the Father in, in terminology is because it, it, it um, tells you about the relationship. So a father, if you like, can give birth to a son, can create a son, but the son can't create the father. It can create its own children, but it can't ever create the father. So the, it's not first in time, but the father is primal, source, yeah? Okay, so, but the, you can't have a son without the presence of a father, and you can't have a father without the presence of a son. So it's two sides of one coin. You can't have a one-sided coin. It's, it's gonna always have two sides. So the coin exists as one, Although you could, you know, say there's two parts to it. Not physically, obviously. But the idea of a tails and the idea of a heads. Yeah? Okay, and then the Holy Spirit, which makes up the triad, now is the voice for God. Now, if we imagine this is a dream, because a dream analogy works really well. In your dream, let's say you're having a nightmare, okay? And your, your father is there seeing that you're twitching and having a terrible time. The father can't go into the dream to pull you out. He says, Johnny, Johnny, wake up, wake up. Sends the voice in to pull the consciousness to the voice. So that's why God isn't here in a nightmare that we have made ourselves. But he sends the voice, his voice, which is the Holy Spirit, into the dream to pull us out, help us out. And if we follow that voice, like if you were lost in the forest and you followed the rescuers going, come this way, come this way, you will escape. You will come out of the dream. What wakes you up out of your dream at night? Usually the alarm, isn't it? 
or the light or something pulls you out, wakes you up. So it's called the voice for God. It's also called the comforter. Um, it only thinks and sees the truth because it is still the mind of God as such. But God can't lose its oneness, its wholeness, its truth. Therefore, it can't see as such the nightmare that we've created. Like a father where his child is sleeping can't see the nightmare that they're having. The content of it, yeah? Just knows that they're asleep and having a horrible time. And so our kindness wants to wake them up. So this is what the Course is doing. The Course is really the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, actually it's Jesus's... So it was channeled through a lady in the 60s who um, says it was Jesus's words. She doesn't like that. She didn't want that. But, you know, this is what it was. And... I believe it's the correct teachings of Jesus because the Bible has become so warped and lost and egos have got involved and we're not understanding it in the same way you don't understand the course when you first read it. So this, I think, is the um, Jesus coming through to um, correct where we've all gone astray in our thinking and our understanding of the ego and psychology and all that kind of stuff. Because the Bible is teaching psychology as well. You know, Genesis, I've done YouTube videos on Genesis and Revelation, it's all about psychology. It's not really, you know, Adam and Eve were what you think they were. So, um, this is what the Holy Spirit is here for. You know it, you hear that other voice in your head, don't you? That when the negative one is talking, there's always another voice. At the beginning, it's very quiet because we're so used to the shouting of the ego and listening to that ego. But if you start to pay attention and give that voice space, it gets louder and louder. And it's always that one that's telling you the good thing. Head heart battles. So traditionally, we think the ego is the left brain, which controls the right side of the body. And the right side, control, right brain controls the left side of the body. And the right brain is known as the creative spiritual side. And it's interesting that the heart is towards the left, isn't it? Because that's run by the right creative spiritual side. So in my therapies a lot, I, I use heart breathing to connect people with their spiritual or subconscious side that knows everything. So that voice, you know, used to call it wise inner advisor, universe, soul, spirit. I call it it's actually the Can Holy you Spirit. Can explain what, how you do that? What you just said? What, the heart breathing? Mm. Okay, so I get people to focus, uh, to see the heart like an organ, so that as you breathe in, you see the heart inflating, and as you breathe out, you see the heart deflating. You listen to either the heartbeat or the breath, um, and then I will come in and, and ask questions of the subconscious mind. So it's seeing it, feeling the heart in the left side of the chest, and listening because what that does really is um, gives your conscious mind something else to do clears the space and you could say the conscious mind is the ego because it's usually full of our fears and things um, which leaves space then for that different voice to come through which knows everything always knows the answer okay so the next important word is see now again so Sin, as we use it on this level of material world, is either I have done something to offend God, I have, you know, committed adultery, killed somebody, you know, whatever your definition of sin is, and it's usually the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Okay, so it's an offence against God, traditionally, for which I must then say sorry, offer reparation, Hail Marys, or, you know, do something to correct it. Our whole society is uh, created on that, all of our laws, because what do the laws say? You mustn't steal and, and kill and, you know, cheat and all those kinds of stuff. Um, however, the Course uses the word sin in a different way. So whenever I read the Course now and I see sin, I read separation. Because for the Course, the only error is that we believe 
that we are separated from God, that we're here now in a material world, in a material body, and we're suffering all this terrible stuff and God's not helping us. So our, our thing is that, and again, I think this is the story of Lucifer in the Bible. Lucifer was an angel of light who then decided that he loved himself so much and he was so great that he could create his own world. He wanted to usurp the power of God, create his own world and his own beings and rule that world, Well, which then turned into Satan, the devil. Okay. So that story in some way reflects what we have done, that we um, have separated ourselves from God, i.e. we've cut all of that knowledge off, created perception, and created a world that we create and we um, um, want, or wanted definitely at the beginning, and in the course it describes that like it's a child's tea party, and the child gets so engrossed in the tea party, she's given, you know, these personas to her toys and she's feeding them tea and she goes, how are you today, Mrs. Rabbit? And, da -da -da -da. and the rabbit will talk back to her and all of it. So that child is so engrossed in the reality of that tea party, completely forgets the parents downstairs, let's say, and is having a wonderful time, except that we have completely forgotten that we created this tea party, we've given power to everyone in our lives and that now we feel lost. How do we stop that tea party if you've forgotten that you are the one that's actually projecting that power and creating it? So the only way out is what? The parents go, Tilly, Tilly, dinner time! And then she comes out of it, withdraws her attention. Your attention is your creative power. Life from the toys and then she goes back downstairs with her parents god does that make sense as an analogy okay so where i i read sin i read separation because the only thing we've ever done wrong in some ways was had a mad tiny idea as the course says and forgot to laugh so who the crazy idea that you can be anywhere else other than here and now is bonkers, mad, isn't it? Where else are you going to go? In, if there is eternity and infinity, w there is nowhere else for you to go, nowhere else for you to be, no time in which you are not within God, within all that is, etc., etc. So it must be illusory then, mustn't it? Must be a fantasy, a projection. Yes, And if you think about the only thing you absolutely know is that you exist. And I always go back to, okay, if God is all that is, the only thing in existence, I know I'm not God, but I know I exist, therefore I must be the Son of God. That to me is undeniable. There's a big full stop there for me. That's the only thing I abs absolutely know. And if I know I'm the Son of God, and He is eternal and infinite, infinite, then I must still be there. I could not have actually gone anywhere else. It must be an illusion. And if it's an illusion or a dream, I can wake up from it. So these, to me, are undeniable facts. But if I read sin in the way that the ego wants me to read sin, I've lost that realisation about the problem is separation. And we get into blame and guilt and all the other things. Okay, So the ego has hijacked that word sin. So you have to redefine it for yourself as the error, if you like, of separation. The Course actually defines it as lack of love at one place, which is lack of God, which is separation. <laughs> So it's the same thing. Does this make sense? Okay, so where it says sinless then, it's lack of separation, i.e. communion. So when I say sinless, I read communion, joining. 
Now guilt, so sin leads to guilt. So if you read sin and you let that ego definition go, uh, uh, run, then you, you get into guilt because we feel guilty for what we believe we've done wrong or what somebody else has done to us. We want to make them feel guilty, which is an attack, isn't it? It's a punishing thing. So you either punish yourself or you've punished the person you think has sinned against you. Okay, if you look at the word... Just look at the GLT, God's loving thoughts, which is the miracle, yeah? And we have put a U and an I in between it, which is the separation, isn't it? You couldn't be more clearer visually of what we've done. We've created an ego self and a supposed spirit self and, and another, other people, and we've put them in between, blocked off God's loving thoughts, if you like, and created this world that we are totally focused on. Not focused on God-loving thoughts anymore. We're focused on me and you. And what you do to me and what I do to you. And this is real. And this is the only thing that exists. So we've separated ourselves off from the miracle. Separated ourselves off from God's loving thoughts. By wanting this world, believing in it, and keep creating it. So, um, that again, guilt really is about the separation. That's why the guilt really is linked to sin, because they're both talking about the separation. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, now, so when you've sinned and you feel guilty um, on this ego level of the world, the thing that you're then told is you need to forgive. Now, in the course where it talks about forgiving, it really means giving up to the Holy Spirit, foregoing. So when you read forgiveness, read giving up in brackets to the Holy Spirit. Now, it's really important that you understand forgiveness. In the ego's terms, we were talking about this earlier with Eileen, that, you know, if somebody does something bad to you or you've done something bad to them, you have to say sorry. And if I choose to let you, you know, let you off the hook and forgive you, um, you know, I seem like a better person and vice versa. If you were kind enough to forgive me, I feel really grateful and thank God you've done that for me. So it introduces levels, right? And there are no levels. We're all equal. We're all one. Okay, so again, this is separation, isn't it? By the back door, if you like. So the ego has hijacked forgiveness to make it, again, just a, a reinforcement of separation and division and levels and attack and all that. Because if you have to make reparation for something you've done, you've said it's real. Because in a dream, if I kill somebody... It doesn't really happen and I don't feel guilty and I don't have to correct anything, do I? Do I? No, you just go, oh, I had a weird dream, I killed you in my dream and we'll all laugh and, and we know it's not real. And you feel thank God when you wake up. <laughs> exactly. And that's what we will feel, or we should be understanding now is, you don't have to feel bad because you're not actually doing anything here. We can't actually do anything physically because the physical body doesn't even exist, but that's a whole thing down the road. Yes? It's a thought-based reality. And so you can change your mind in any moment, can't you? Easy said and done. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in control of your mind, says Eileen's ego. Anyway, okay. So do you get that? Yeah. Right. Okay, so you have to redefine forgiveness and understand how the Course uses it. The Course says it's giving up to the Holy Spirit. Now, because you don't know you're dreaming, or for most of your life you haven't realised you're dreaming, a dream character can't change what's happening in the dream, can it? Because you only know you're dreaming once you've woken up and reflect on it. Whilst you're dreaming, you have no power, you conscious mind, over the dream, do you? There is a dreamer part of the mind that's creating this for you. 
But you don't know about the dream character and the characters don't know about the dreamer who's making this dream up. We thankfully are waking up with the course now so we can become aware, oh hang on a minute, the dreamer is creating this. There's a different part of me, a different self uh, that's causing this. And I'm experiencing it and creating it. Again, a split self, isn't it? Two selves. And that's without the divisions of the ego and the spirit. And there's another part of you that's completely awake, in, still happy with God, because can, you can't actually go anywhere. But that where we're dividing the consciousness and the selves up, we become lost about who we really are. And one can affect the other. Does that make sense? We won't get into till later till all the different selves, but you you can, you have an experience, don't you? That you want to do something and you do something completely different. So then, what's that about? There's two sides, isn't there, of the self, at least? Okay. So we can't do anything here, but I know a man that can. So if I give it up to the Holy Spirit, now. The important thing is Holy Spirit is out of time and space, right? The rules of time and space don't apply to it. And so it can actually collapse time and space. Like if you write a word wrongly, you can rub it out and it doesn't exist anymore, does it? Okay, you can correct errors. So this is what the Holy Spirit can do. We can't do it here because we are in time and space. So if me and I leave, we are great friends here and we have an argument and we don't talk to each other for 30 years, right? There's this time of uh, 30 years, time and space, yeah? But if here, excuse me, here, I then decide to give it up to the Holy Spirit and forgive, even on this level, we come back to this place where we're friends again, don't we? If she forgives me and I forgive her, we're great friends again. So what we've actually done is erase space and time and come back to the first point. That's what I mean about you're going back in time. It looks like your life's going forward, but you're actually erasing all the rubbish to get you back. You know when you a dream, you, you kind of come out of the dream. There's a journey back to consciousness. This is what's happening. So on this, on this level... I might, we might forgive each other, but we will remember what's gone. We, and remembering is to still hold on to the story. Okay, so we can't actually ever clear it 100%. But the Holy Spirit actually erases the space and time, and we go back to that point where we were brilliant friends. This is mentally, obviously, not physically, because there is only mind. Yeah? And then... It's gone forever. If you've, if you've given it to the Holy Spirit and it's been forgiven, it's erased forever. You can't ever access it again as such in that same state. Does that make sense? So it's really important that we don't try to do it. You give it up to the Holy Spirit. It's going to take trust and faith. That's really what trust and faith is about. Because it's no good me giving up and then trying to sort it all out in my life here. Because I haven't really released it as unwanted. Can I ask you, Teresa, would that also apply to, say, past trauma in your life? Being able to trust. And that's the problem people have. And they keep having the same things haunting us because, through past events or whatever. Yeah. Because we haven't truly let them go. Is yeah. that the point you're making? Yeah, because... You still believe in a past. And you believe that everything happened to you, happened to you and was real. You're making the dream real. So you really have to get this, that it's a dream and act the same way in your life as you would do in a dream. And just wake up and when you realise what's gone on, go, oh my God, <laughs> you know, how funny. I dreamed that you did this to me yesterday. It was not real, so I can just let it go forgive but if I hang on to it or I make it real then it I'm holding that thought in my mind you know that I was trying this is the power of God he holds the sun the thought of the sun in the mind which gives life to and creates the sun we're the same so if I hold hate 
in my heart, or I remember still that argument me and Eileen had, I'm holding it, create, keep recreating it, and I'll never ever let it go. Because this life force is powerful, it's creating universes. So if you hold on to anything, you are going to keep seeing it and experiencing it in your life. That's why foregoing, forgiveness is the key and you can't do it for yourself. That's the real, real important one. Um, along with that is forgetting. Because really forgetting is like foregoing in the same way. So it's, and the Course talks about giving up Forgiving, forgetting, giving up to remember better. So if I let go of all the crap, I will only be able to have in my mind, because there's only a space of here and now, and I feel it. So if my mind is focused on God's loving thoughts, what else can be in that space and that time? Nothing. And it, so... I, it will only ever come back if I'm not filling the space and time with what I truly want. Which is why Jesus says, keep vigilant for your thoughts. The only difference between me and you is I know only this. He only was focused on filling the space and the time with God. Okay, and then atonement, at one moment is really undoing. This is where we're working backwards. Everything that we created on the way out, if you like, is being undone on the way back. Until you become at one with yourself and God. So it's the atonement. So these three things leave you with what is when the lies of the ego, which create this unreality, this illusion, are forgiven given up completely and what's left is reality god christ and heaven okay <laughs> i'm assuming you got that okay now heaven is not a place heaven is a state of mind peace love knowledge certainty safety then you are in heaven, because remember there's only mind. So what would heaven look like in your mind? Peace, joy, love, all of those words. So this is what we're actually going back to as such. Heaven isn't where you, you know, go up with all the spirits and sit with God in the way that we normally think about it. It is, but it's not a physical thing as such. It's a return to that peace of God in your mind and creating with God, through God. Now, perception, this is really coming down to the material world now. Perception. In the Course it states that it opposes knowledge and therefore it opposes God because God is knowledge, remember, from the beginning. So, perception is the, it's not really, it is the opposite, if you like, of God. So, God is objective truth, perception is subjective, isn't it? And it's something that you take in. I perceive you wearing that headband and top and jeans and so I'm taking the information in from my eyes what I'm hearing you say, what I'm feeling, all of those. It's information coming in, isn't it? Perception. Whereas knowledge, feel, feel something that you know, like I am. It feels internal. It's set, it's changeless, it's all of those things that we talked about of God, isn't it? So it's completely different to perception. Now, because we are in this dream, we can only perceive. Because you can't get away from yourself, can you? 
Unfortunately, no. No. <laughs> we can try and have objective knowledge, but here you're always going to have a story about what you're seeing. It's very rare that we, we can have objective knowledge. We can have true perception, what's true for you, but that's not the same as knowledge. Because knowledge never changes, and it's the same for everyone and never changes. Making sense? Okay, so um, it's subjective, it's story, it's usurping truth. It changes and therefore it's illusory. Knowledge is objective, true, whole, changeless, and has no opposite, no other, and doesn't involve choice. You don't get to choose what's true. What's true is true and will always be true. And basically, that's God. Okay. Now, in the course it talks about projection makes perception. Now, projection. So this is the other big thing we have to understand on this level. If we think about the dream, the dreamer who's lying in bed doing absolutely nothing except thinking, projects to a different part of its mind, if you like, its eyes, just for ease of, of talking, or its conscious mind, we should say, a dream scenario. Now, let's say me, let's say we're dreaming, me and Eileen are arguing and she's horrible and I'm never going to forgive her <laughs> and all of this, right? I have this dream. Okay, now I'm going to see it, I'm going to hear it, I'm going to feel it, I'm going to have a real experience of it, aren't I? So, that is, but that is, has been projected away from my mind, because if my mind was one, I couldn't experience it as being kind of there. When you dream, you kind of see it there, don't you, as such? You know, you, you are in the dream character and it happens around you like our life here. I feel like I'm here and you're there, you're other. And it would take me some time to get to you. So actually you're, you know, away from me in space and time. And so if this is a dream, I, I'm totally engrossed in it, you seem as if you're in another space and another time, but you're not really, are you? You're in my head, here and now, because this is the only time and space there is. So in order for the ego to create these divisions and separate you from the here and now all the time, it creates past and tries to make you believe that's true, and it creates the idea of a future. But you can, you're never in the future, you never get to tomorrow, it's always today. And the past only exists in your head, doesn't it? There's a story. Okay, so the only moment that exists is the here and now, but we have projected, oh, I was a baby, I grew up, I did this, I did that. That is a projection in time away from the here and now, and the same with the future. I project that there's tomorrow. So it's a separation tool, isn't it? Because it's, I am here and now, the past is somewhere else and the future is somewhere else, isn't it? At a different time. But that's impossible, isn't it? As we've seen at the beginning. In truth, that is impossible. Because I can't be anywhere else in another time. So it keeps coming back round to the same thing, if you understand the terminology. But we believe in projection. And projection is um, separation. Division, me against you, you are other and therefore you can be against me. So it excludes you from me and I can exclude you from the nice group. If I judge, this is where judgment comes in, Elaine to be the, uh, my best friend here, okay? I paradoxically have excluded you, I've dropped you down, put Eileen up here and everyone else down here. Division, separation, rejection. In some ways that's an attack because you might think, oh, why am I not her best friend? <laughs> All of this thing then comes from that. Okay? So projection, division, exclusion. That weakens you because the truth is that you are whole and one and an amazing creative power. But I've just kind of given power to Eileen and paradoxically taking it from you 
and myself, because I've just made myself ego, not God, not Christ. I've just put myself in ego, not Christ. And I've put you in ego as well. Um, and it's not a truth, and it relies on a closed loop, doesn't it? So if I believe you are real and separate from me, I'm cause, your effect, and then uh, an effect then creates another cause, doesn't it? So if I throw a glass of water at you, you are going to go, oh my God, why did you do that? <laughs> to which I'm going to react. And therefore we are in a continuous loop that we now believe this argument is really real and can't get out of. So from the very first moment we created projection, we're just now stuck in a closed loop of cause and effect. That makes sense. Okay, so we need something to break that loop to bring us out. Something that's not in here, on this level. Einstein said, "You can't create, you can't solve a problem on the level in which it's created. Something has to come from a different level." He knew that. Okay, and it's perception. Um, you get what you expect because it's a mind-based reality. Like in your dream, you are creating the dream. You are creating all the dream characters and they follow your rule. Because who else is creating the dream? When you're asleep in bed, there's nobody else. No one has any influence on it whatsoever. Therefore, you are playing out your mind, aren't you? The story from your mind. And creating enemies and creating conflict or creating joy or creating whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. But it's yours and only yours. Um, so yeah, so projection actually then creates separation, we can then have blame, we can have anger, which is really powerlessness, because I'm giving all my toys, remember, the power, um, that then brings me fear, false evidence appearing real, that you can do anything to me, you can't, how can you do anything to me, it's all in my head, what are you going to do, you've got no power, unless I give you that power to do something to me. Um, which then induces attack and all the way back round. Then I have to defend or attack back and again that's that loop. Important to understand to undo projection is that the mind, and the Course says this, the mind cannot create outside of itself. My mind can't attack your mind. My body can attack you, my thoughts. Uh, so thoughts coming through uh, the mouth, etc. But I, my mind cannot attack you. I can attack you in my mind, but you can't attack me in my mind, can you? And that's why in therapy I'm always saying, nobody can affect you unless you allow them to. You can call me whatever you like. It go, I can just put it in one ear, out the other. Or I can go, oh my God, she hates me, it must be true, I'm a terrible person. But that's my choice, isn't it? In my mind, I've created a story. I've perceived it in a certain way, however I want. To be strong, or to be <laughs> weakened by you. Yeah? So that brings us on to the ego. So the pseudo-self, when I read ego, I read pseudo-self. It's not the real you, it's the character, let's say, Teresa. Okay? Teresa isn't real. Teresa is a, um, a collection of values, of characteristics, which are all just stories I want to tell about myself. Okay? But it's not real because it can change. It's not truth because it can change. Teresa will die, will disappear. I will let her go. My spirit will continue. And on this level, if I wasn't awake, I might then just go and create another body. Past lives. But you, you have to believe in a past to have a past life, don't you? So it's a really insidious closed loop. Um, the ego is actually an opposing thought system. It uses its body as the temple. And because the body, the mind doesn't exist in the body, the body exists in the mind, <coughs> the, 
Therefore you get lost and confused because you think you're a body, but this body has power over you. So I'm, for, you know, my whole life is spent at tennis trying to overcome the ego because it's a physical sport. And when I hit a, a shot and it goes to somewhere completely different, who did that? When I say to myself, right, I'm going to hit a really good forehand or I'm going to hit it across the net there and it goes over there, who's in control of my body? Who did that? It would seem like my body has a mind of its own. You know, people don't like it, but you make yourself sick because the body is in the mind. The body, even on this level, you could say, can only follow instructions from the mind, can't it? When your brain's dead, your body's dead. The body can't move without the brain. And the brain is just the receiver for the mind. Therefore, the mind must be creating everything that the body does. Everything. Autoimmune diseases. If you hate yourself. If you're doing the course and you believe you're a body, it's the self attacking the self, isn't it? So this ego is a pseudo-self, it's an opposing thought system, and it believes in the body. And we were talking before, when we do really good work and we try and become enlightened, and, or we make a breakthrough, the ego will want to come in and destroy it and set you back again, it feels. But it isn't. It's that that bit got cleared, so then it comes up with the next thing. I spend my life in therapy chasing people's ego. When I say, well, why is that? They'll give me one answer. And then I go, but how does that work then? Because da, da, da. And then you go, oh, no, really, it's this. And I go, okay, then. And I call that out. And they go, no, really, it's this. And I spend my heart until the ego has nowhere left to run. Because the ego is the part, if you like, is the dream character going, this life's happening to me. I don't know why, let me make up a reason so at least I can feel safe. So if I hear noises upstairs and I'm here on my own at night, um, if I sit here and go, oh my God, what's that, what's that? I, I suffer fear. But if I can say to myself, oh, it's because the window's open upstairs, I feel okay. See, just changing the story, isn't it? Just, just completely in my head. I don't know what's upstairs. I'm not upstairs. But just by telling one story or the other, I have a completely different reaction and that therefore then will make my next action and the action after that and the action after that. And Teresa, does that link in with what you, you were saying before about giving it, because I remember you saying, right, I'm putting it on the altar and I found that so helpful in our past sessions, literally having trust, giving it up. Yeah. Okay, there might be, but I'm giving it up, I know I'm going to be safe, Holy Spirit, I, I give it up, it? I'm putting it with yeah. you. Yeah, because there is nothing else. There is, you're always safe because there is nothing else. This is like really stepping back. The quickest way to do the course is to actually not work on anything in, in your real life, but just to give everything up. It's just a dream. Take back the moment now. Reassert, which for me is now knowledge, obvious as such, that I am the son of God. There is only the here and now. And that resets me. Because now I'm facing that way, if you like. What's behind me doesn't exist. Nothing exists unless you think about it. Unless you pay attention, which is giving your life force, holding that thought in your mind right back at the beginning. Unless you do that, it doesn't exist. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you're not thinking about at that moment, are you? One of my clients, she, who's really low self-esteem, she says, oh, but when I go out of here, I've forgotten it all. I can't hold this information. And I'm, so I'm trying to say to her, you don't need to hold that information. It's gone in there. You don't remember how you walk, do you? You don't remember every time you fell over and what you did and all of that. It's gone. That's all that's gone. Because in this moment now, you've allowed yourself to know how to walk. Yeah, but you have to keep on and practice, practice, isn't it? You know, like no, that's the belief. But when you learnt to walk, you didn't just get up and walk, did you? Did you yeah, ever learn to walk? Does the past well, exist? It just, it just mm -hmm. comes. Okay, it? but practice. my point, the point I'm making, Eileen, is if you're going to do the course properly, which I'm being really strict today, mm -hmm. you're talking rubbish because the past doesn't exist. Okay. It's a story. Like it's just a story. Isn't it? A person that went out and she picked up everything, but you do, it's too much to take in consciously. Um, 
and you go and, and, and it, you can't remember it all. It would take a long time to, for that to all to go in. Yeah, but the point is you don't have to remember anything because you have a direct co a voice in you that knows everything, the Holy Spirit. That's when you get the faith in it. Mm. Well, you, that's what I'm saying. The quickest way, if you really want to do the course, just give everything up and let everything be. And would you say, Teresa, that's probably the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Is giving it up. Yeah. Because we are so conditioned. We have this past. Yeah. We have these stories that we're telling ourselves. Yeah. And so to actually give it up, as you said, you have your moment where you're in here and you think it's real and you have to bring yourself back yeah. to, and rem constantly remind yourself. Yeah. And that's kind of the tough bit. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what, and that's what Jesus says. Just be vigilant. All you have to do is be vigilant for your mind. And when you realise you've gone off into a story, reset the here and now and the only truth that I am the Son of God. That's all I know. Where am I going to go for now? Because Bashar, one of the channels, um, I always remember him saying about memory and someone saying, I've got a bad memory. And he said, no, that's just a belief. Because memory doesn't exist. If there is no past, there is only the here and now. You are recreating everything now. Okay, you're creating everything now, not recreating. Okay, so when, for example, so I was trying to then let go of worrying about, you know, remembering everything. Um, and what I had to do, because my ego is then in one ear going, oh, that's Alzheimer's, if you can't remember, oh, your memory's getting really bad. You know, if you let all your memory go, how are you going to live, how are you going to exist? And that would be true if I didn't have, like, an earpiece in with somebody who knows everything, telling me everything I need to know in the moment I need to know it. Like this this morning. I haven't, I haven't got a script, I haven't rehearsed this. I just know that it comes through me now. I couldn't, if, you, if I was to sit here and try to remember all of the course, 668 pages of what, you know, that would be impossible, wouldn't it, for my tiny little mind. But now I understand, you know, I've, I've been through like channeling, thinking that I was channeling someone else and all, you know, all that. But then I realised, but actually, I am channeling the Holy Spirit. Because that's the whole point of it. It's voices within you, it exists within you, it's never going to leave you. Because it's the voice for God. Where's God going to go? <laughs> Can't go anywhere. It's always with you, it's always there. Where are you going to go? You can't go anywhere. But you can choose not to listen to it. Because when I give you a box of chocolates, you have to receive and accept it. Otherwise, I can't give it to you. So in the Bible, it talks all the time about the ears to hear and those who listen. Because there's a difference between hearing. You might hear everything I say today. But are you going to listen? Are you going to do anything with it? Have you taken it in? Have you received it as the gift that it is? It's your choice, isn't it? Because you could leave here without anything. I'm stuck on this one. Okay. Forgive them for my sins. When someone you believe has sinned against you, and you're going to say, no, they didn't. It was all in the mind. So what are you asking me? I'm asking you to, how do I unravel it? Because as you say, it's all about undoing it. I know I'm going to annoy you. <laughs> but it's <laughs> not your job to it. unravel it. You see, this is the, this is but really. That's what the course is, isn't it? You're undoing. No, you're not. It's teaching you that the Holy Spirit <laughs> will undo anything you give to it. It will actually erase it, collapse it. But when you try to do it, you're trying to forgive for a sin that you believe has happened, and therefore your belief, be and live, your belief makes it real. Because I'm holding that thought. Remember the power of God? He's sending that thought to create a son and hold him in, reality, hold him in existence. Because if God took that power away, Christ would disappear. Everything would disappear. So he's always, this is why they're trying to say he's always thinking of you. Because really that's what it is. Mind, capital M, is the initial and activating agent of spirit. Activating agent of spirit, keeping me alive, flowing, that's my life force. And the life force that I use to then create myself. If you could see that, 
I don't know if I've got it on here. I'm going to do one on mirrors. I don't know if I. How do you forgive someone and say they never oh, done it? I don't know. I can't get that. Mm. Okay. Because you are the ego that doesn't exist, trying to forgive another ego that doesn't exist. <laughs> Exactly, it's bonkers mm. madness. Okay, that's the actual mm -hmm. truth, right? Yeah, yeah, if you yeah, understand definitely. that, but for you, because you believe it's real, you can't do anything about it. But the Holy Spirit that does know and can erase time and space because it's outside of it, it will do it for you. Because it's erasing time and space. Can you erase time and space? No. Because you are a time and space being. The ego will not let you get out of time and space. You need somebody else that's out of time and space to be able to do that for you. So you're the one here. You're the one in the cinema, right? The film just happens for you, doesn't it? You have no power over the film whatsoever. However, the projectionist, if I'm the projectionist, you could say to me, oh, cut that scene out, I don't like that scene. So I'll take the reel out, I'll unreel it, cut it out, cut that scene out, put it back together again, put it back on the reel. Does that, that make more sense? Mm. <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit, if you like, is the, is the film editor, the projectionist. Mm. Yeah? Okay. Can I start, you know, like you said, all there is is the here and now. Then how do you get through, obviously, in my belief system, I believe I was a baby and then I grew up. Listen to your language. I'm being and living as if I was a baby. Does, does the past exist anywhere? Can you prove you were ever born? Pictures. <laughs> yeah, but you'll be looking at them now. <laughs> I'd be looking at it now, wouldn't I? So yeah. here I am, here I am as a baby. But I would be looking at it in the here and now. Yeah. So that doesn't prove that you were born. You're spiritual. Okay, do you believe you're going to die? Yeah, uh, well, my, my transition in terms of body, yeah. Okay, so you'll let the body go and your spirit will go on. Yeah. Okay, so how were you born then? Didn't you just have an experience of creating a body that your spirit went into? Mm. Created the idea of a body? Mm. Well, that's the, isn't that the same as dying? So therefore, were you born into a physical body or is it just an idea? I'll let you think about that one. Mm -hmm. Must move on. Yeah. It's like literally... I know it's... Everything you're saying, it's like... I know it's <laughs> massive. I know it. No, like when you, it's like it's, you know, not even really it will come. You're listening. So the physical like... body was born, but your spirit just went from one body into another. No, nothing is born. Nothing is physical. That's the bit I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I know. I'm nowhere near that. Yet. I know. Yeah, I know. It's, it, it's going. You hear people saying that, and suddenly you think they're crazy. But yeah. now you're actually talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you sit and pay attention. You know, you'll you'll um, you'll be able to have different experiences. If you if you really think about it, okay, say like your journey here. It was your mind moving in some ways. Okay, say this is say this is scenery, right? And I've got a bike. Now, does the bike move past the scenery, or is the scenery moving past the bike? Depends if you're standing still. What I'm saying is there's two different ways of looking mm. at it, isn't it? Which one is the truth? Mm. So I would say, because there's only mind, it's your mind moving through ideas and landscapes and things like that. But like the bike, it's static. It's so, the so would it, would scenery it, that moves. Would it be like time? I was kind of thinking time's moving through you, you're not moving through time. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. It moves through your head. Yeah. The only place that it can move, because that's the only place it exists. In your head. Where else is it going to move? And if time doesn't exist, and there's only here and now, you, how can you have ever been born before? How are you going to die after? You really have to sit and meditate on these things, because they all 
makes sense. It, it's like so obvious once but you, you see. But you'll still have that experience, won't you? Yeah, because all your experience is in your head. Yeah, exactly. So you'll experience being born into several lifetimes, if that's what you... If that's what you choose yeah. to create the experience of. But it's mm. the experience you're having, not the reality. Can I ask you, Teresa, so when you do past life regression then, that's basically just stories people tell themselves? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, depending on the, that client, it depends what I, how, you know, spiritual they are and how far down the road. If mm. they want to just do a past life as if it's real, I will do a past life as if it's real because I know it's going to bring healing for them today. Yeah. And often mm. when we do past life, people have come for, you know, actually end up doing grief work and all different other kinds of work. It's the only way their mind could get them here. And when I was training to be a hypnotherapist, hypnotherapist, I remember them saying, if somebody's in deep trauma and they won't face it, they won't go there, do it as a past life. So when you So offer, they're separated from sorry it. To sorry to interrupt. So when you offered that to me, would I have been telling myself stuff that I wanted to hear and um, I would have convinced myself, oh that happened so I felt better? It depends on your belief. Depends mm. on your belief, not my belief. So that would have been actually nothing real going on there. Well, there's nothing real going on anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you believe that this is real, then that is a real part of that. It's a real experience. doesn't matter if it happens physically. It's a real experience because that's the only place that the experience, uh, that, that life is. Experience. So you've experienced it all, and then what's this... You do it as a past life, something that happened before then, but you've experienced it. Well, you may believe you have experienced it, or you may want to create the experience of it now with some separation from it. So by saying it's a past life, I go, oh, that was lucky that ain't me today. Or I killed someone, I was a murderer in my past life. Okay, so... I might have murderous thoughts now or murderous intents that I are so uncomfortable I project them away or, or we deny them, don't we? But I might be able to deal with that in, if I believed it was a past self doing that, not me. But do we carry, carry guilt and things from our perceived experiences of past lives? Let's say I believe in a past life I was a murderer. Would I feel the guilt in this life? If you wanted to. Right. Mm. Okay. Some people will be able to separate that. You might be, oh God, that makes me even worse now. Right. Could we say, Teresa, that it's stories and characters that we create to make sense to ourselves and our ego because of the separation? Yeah. Mm. And though the, everyone that you're creating in your life is an aspect of you. If I stand in front of that mirror, I get a full reflection of myself. If I stood in front of the mirror, the mirror ball there or whatever, I get aspects of myself. So even though you are me or my dream character, I've separated you out, made you different so that I can say, oh no, it's you, you're the horrible one, not me. But remember when you point the finger, most of the fingers point back to you because I'm the only dreamer. So me and, my, um, me and my best friend were saying literally last night, we were saying how we always come into contact with wonderful people, we never come into contact with anyone bad or malicious or anything like that. Would you say that is all part of it and part of working towards, you know, actually being at comfort with yourself? Yeah. Because you're not seeing any horrible traits yeah. in anyone else that you don't actually want to see with yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like dropping the judgement, isn't it? That's dropping the ego, mm. isn't it, Teresa? Dropping judgement mm. of it's others. It's really more on the spiritual path, isn't yeah. it? If you only know love and you only think everyone's wonderful, it's like trust, I, you know, I trust everyone and everything. I don't believe in evil, I don't be, you know, believe there's bad people out there, you know, on this mainstream level, just putting the course away for a moment. I don't, I don't believe, you know, people say to me, oh, you have people coming to your house, what about men and all that, don't you ever feel, no, it never ever occurs to me, never had any problems whatsoever, because I don't believe in it, I won't be it and live it. You can't see what you don't believe in. You can't experience it. If you don't believe in green garshkas, how are you ever going to see one and recognise it as a green garsha? So what's a garsha? Nothing. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point. <laughs> okay, really, really quickly, because I need a cup of tea. Okay, 
So the ego is the pseudo self where it talks about light, it's the light of understanding. It's not talking about electric light. Because we go, oh, I see what you mean. We have language that do. So it's the light of understanding. Uh, meaning's an interesting word. Because when we read it, what it's really talking about is the creative power of God, i.e. means, the way. So when you read meaning, I always read the creative power of God, the way that God does something. Or, um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that reading. Uh, if you want to make a note, read 96.1 to the end of 97.8. And the brother is different levels of reality. Or, so it, the brother talks about your brother all the time. It depends on what level you're doing the course or what subject you're thinking about. So it can be the Christ and the rest of the sonship, the rest of the points of view, yeah, because the Christ is one, but you can have different points of view within it. Uh, and they would be your brothers as such. There's different selves, so the three, the one that's fully awake, doesn't know you're dreaming if you like, the spirit, the dreamer, and the third is the dream character. They would be your brothers. Uh, or it could be the self, and on this material level, other people. So you would be my brothers on this material um, level as such. So the course, I'm going to end where the course actually starts. It says, nothing unreal exists. None of this exists. Nothing real can be threatened. Don't have to worry about what you truly are and oh look at Birdie. Oh, Robbie Redness. Mm. Um, what you truly are and um, none of that can be damaged. Your eternal spirit can never be damaged. You haven't done anything to it, you're not evil, you're not bad. It's all just an illusion. And that will never change. So it doesn't matter how bad you think you are here, it's just a dream. Who you truly are can never be changed. And herein lies the peace of God. And some key phrases. There is only here and now. This is why mindfulness work. Always just keep yourself in the here and now. What do I know? I know I am the son of God. Nothing else is real. That is me. That's my reset. And I feel it. I feel the space. If I am feeling the space... Nothing else can come into it. If I fill the space with my thoughts of God, if I'm telling myself I am the son, I paradoxically am also reminding myself I have a father. Aren't I? So you don't have to go through, oh, I am the son. By telling myself I am the son, the relationship is inferred, the father. There's only here and now, therefore, I, here is God, the Christ, the Holy Spirit, and everything in reality is here, now, here, in this spot, in this... Because, really quickly, Bashar, one of the channels, when they were asking him how um, spacecrafts move through, you know, like, say, like, to get to, I don't know, Uranus is about ten light years, let's say, just for ease. Uh, we couldn't travel that far. It would take certain light years. But they can do it, right? Aliens can do it. And, he, and someone said, how do they do that? And he said, because their crafts are made of their mind and your location is part of you. So if I think myself here and now and part of that is in this room, I appear in this room, if I was really able on this level to think and believe 100% and know, you have to know, that I am actually on the beach in the Caribbean and I feel that space. So if I went there mentally and filled the space and felt the sun and did all of that, I am actually there. Because there's no physical body anyway. I am where my thoughts are. But I thought that was really interesting, that really keyed with me because I think, oh, I get that. See, he's teaching the course. He's teaching the course. Okay, and um, nothing else is possible. And the key phrase is, do only that. Do only... 
I'm here and now. I am the Christ. Nothing else is real. Doesn't matter what she said to me. And I, <laughs> bring yourself back to this moment now and feel it. Now, when every moment, let's say we have a whole reel of film, but every scene is the same. When I run that film in the cinema, it's going to look like nothing moves, isn't it? That's the holy instant, the only here and now. It's because we think every scene is different and can change, and I'm moving and, and you're moving and all that, that I create a film. But when you stop and all you ever see and know is that I am here now and I am the Son of God, if I could do that, already my mind's thinking, go and put the kettle on. You see, I'm already creating a scene that's going to create the film of my life. If I was really able to just stop and feel every single scene, that I think that's where you get to where God takes that final step and you are then in heaven. Because there is no time and no difference and everything has stopped. So you don't really have to go abroad for the sun, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad about that because I, think I don't want to go abroad anymore. I don't remember it all. On uh, Thursday, we went for lunch and I was early. So I sat in Bromley and I sat on the... And the sun was so gorgeous and I was just sitting there like that and I must have had a big smile on my face. Mm. And a woman came up to me and she went, you're in the Caribbean, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I went, yeah, I actually was. <laughs> I was. In yeah. my mind, I was there, the sun was shining. What's the difference of me being there? What is the difference? No. It's I the same it's experience. Ever. Don't have to go anywhere.